Take your seats. We'll start this very, very special and very popular event with tonight's very special guest. I'm Lisa Consiglio. I'm the executive director of the Aspen Writers Foundation. Thank you for joining us. Um, and for those of you who are heading to our benefit dinner uh, immediately following this, thank you for the, your support of this wonderful organization. It's our 34th annual Aspen Summer Words, and we are delighted to have one of the most charming, lovely, and talented writers that I have ever met. And uh, I don't think she needs much of an introduction. If you have read The Help, you've been treated. If you haven't, you're in for a treat. And tonight, it is my very, 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 very special <laughs> honor to present to you, straight from Atlanta, Georgia, Mississippi native, Catherine Stockett. Thanks, Lisa. Um, wait, will you tell me, how long am I supposed to talk? <laughs> An hour. <laughs> okay, so, well, Will, I really like to make these events uh, more like a conversation. So, um, God knows I don't need to be lecturing anybody. So I, let's just, we'll, I'll do a reading, I'll, I'll do some talking, and then we'll open it up to Q&A, and then if we want to read some more, we'll do that. I just think it's a, it's a more organic way to, to share, you know, stories with the audience, and then the audience members can also share their own stories. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. And I have to tell you, um, I'm not very crunchy. I have... Uh, <laughs> I'm very particular about certain things um, in my life, but the energy here at this festival is so wonderful. And I think it's because not only are we in such a beautiful environment, there's so many writers in one place. And to me, there is nothing more beautiful than creative energy. So I just, I feel, I feel embraced here, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to have some fam familiar faces in the audience, too. Um, so how many people have, have read The Help? <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I won't bore you with too much um, about what the book is about, but I will tell you, uh, I like to share what I think the story is about, and in my mind, it is the story of vastly different women, black and white, rich and poor, from the snobby, tight-ass socialite to the kind of white trash, buxom blonde with too much hair color. And it's the story of how these women choose to treat one another every day. It takes place in my hometown of Jackson, Mississippi in 1963, and a young woman named Skeeter graduates from Ole Miss and moves back, you know, in with her parents. She's the only one in town not married, and she wants to be a writer. But the only job she can find in 1963 for a woman is to write the housekeeping column for the local newspaper. So she takes this job, and she tries to assimilate herself back into, you know, what was her childhood home. But she starts to notice things about her friends. You know, they're all married and have husbands and, you know, three children and station wagons. And at age 23, they already have working for them full-time black maids. Skeeter notices little things at first, like the fact that the help has to keep a separate plate, a separate cup, a separate fork, and a separate cupboard in her friend's kitchens. And bigger things, like the fact that they're not even paid minimum wage. And this is, you know, this is not news to Skeeter. She grew up with a maid in her home who she loved dearly. But for the first time in her life, it starts to bother her. So she gets an idea, and her idea is to join forces with the black maids in town and write in secret 
a tell-all book about what it's really like to work for the white families of Mississippi. And you can imagine how thrilled my family was to find out <laughs> this was the topic of my first novel. <laughs> but what I learned in the process is is almost impossible to define. I mean, as I did my research, I came across stacks and stacks of Jim Crow laws that, that surprised me, horrified me. The fact that blacks and whites in the South were not allowed to play pool together. They were not allowed to be buried in the same graveyard. And the one that, of course, I thought was the most ridiculous was Blacks and whites were not allowed to attend the same school for the blind. <laughs> I'll, I'll share with you quickly how, um, what my childhood was like and how this story really came to be. Before I was born, my great, great, great Aunt Carrie hired a second cook. She was so afraid that her first cook would die and take all of the recipes with her. So she hired Dimitri. Then Aunt Carrie died before any of them. And as was the tradition in the South, Dimitri was then passed on to work for my grandmother. And she worked for our family um, for 32 years, from 7 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon. And, you know, I thought this was just life. I thought this is how everybody in the universe lived. And when I was 24, I moved to New York City, and that was really the first time I realized I had actually had a rather unique childhood compared to the rest of the world. Not everybody had a maid in their kitchen. Dimitri had just such a profound effect on my life, on my family, and such different relationships with my grandmother, who was her employer, and quite stiff in the back, and um, very well-spoken, and, you know, almost absurdly so, but she was a kind woman. Um, and then her, Dimitri's relationship with my father and my uncle was so different, because she came in when they were young boys, but just as they were transitioning into to men. And then us, the grandchildren, you know, we just crawled all over Dimitri and adored her, and she... If you asked her, how many children do you have, she'd say three. And that was me, my sister Susan, and my brother Rob. Dimitri didn't have any children of her own. And uh, for the most part, I believe this. I believe that she considered us her family. It really wasn't until I was in my 30s living in New York City that I asked myself for the first time, oh, my God, what was Dimitri thinking about us all those years. I mean, we knew how we felt about her and how we valued her and, and how important she was, but it had never occurred to me to wonder what was going on inside of her head. And that was really how the first voice in the help, which is Abilene, came through. Um, I'm going to do something I don't usually do. I, I'm so lucky. Sometimes I get to tour with an African-American friend of mine named Octavia, and she is just a hoot. She tours with me. She reads the black voices. I read the white voices. But right now she's locked in a hotel room in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where it's, I think, 102 degrees. And she's making a film, so she wasn't able to join me. But so forgive me, I'm, I'm overstepping my boundaries probably, but I'm going to try to read in the voice of a character by the name of Minnie. Octavia, in many ways, is Minnie. She's who I kept thinking of as I wrote this character. Minnie's about this tall. She's very black-skinned. Um, she really doesn't take any shit from anybody, and neither does Octavia. Um, and in this scene I'm going to read, Minnie is a young girl, and she's sitting at the table with her mother, hearing for the first time what her mother calls the rules. Sit down on your behind, Minnie, because I'm about to tell you the rules for working in a white lady's house. I was 14 years old to the day. 
I sat at the little wooden table in my mama's kitchen, I and that caramel cake on the cooling rack waiting to be iced. Birthdays were the only day of the year I was allowed to eat as much as I wanted. I was about to quit school and start my first real job. Oh, I already knew about housework. After school, I was the one that did most of the cooking and the cleaning. But if I was going off to work in somebody else's house, who'd be looking after ours? Mama turned me by the shoulders so I'd look at her instead of that cake. Mama was a crack whip. She took nothing from nobody. She shook her finger so close to my face, it made me cross-eyed. Rule number one for working for a white lady, Minnie, it is nobody's business. You keep your nose out of your white lady's problems, you don't go crying to her with yours. You can't pay the light bill, your feet are too sore. Remember one thing, white people are not your friends. And when this white lady catches her man with the lady next door, you keep out of it, you hear me? Rule number two, don't you ever let that white lady find you sitting on her toilet. I don't care if you got to come so, go so bad it's coming up out of your hair braids. If there's not one out back for the help, you find yourself a time when she's not there in a bathroom she don't use. Rule number three, when you're cooking white people's food, you taste it with a different spoon. You put that spoon to your mouth, think nobody's looking, put it back in the pot, might as well throw the whole thing out. Rule number four, you use the same cup, same fork, same plate every day. Keep it in a separate cupboard, and you tell that white woman that's the one you'll use from here on out. Rule number five, you eat in the kitchen. Rule number six, you don't hit on her children. White people like to do their own spanking. Rule number seven, this is the last one, Minnie. Are you listening to me? No sass mouthing. Oh, Mama, I said, Mama, I know how to, oh, I hear you when you think I can't mutter about having to clean the stovepipe, Minnie, about the last little piece of chicken left over for poor you. You sass a white woman in the morning, you'll be sassing out on the street in the afternoon. First day at my white lady's house, I ate my ham sandwich in the kitchen, put my plate up in my spot in the cupboard. And when that little brat stole my pocketbook and hid it in the oven, I didn't whoop her on the behind. But when that white lady said, now, I want you to be sure and hand wash all the clothes first, then put them in the electric machine to finish up. I said, why I got to hand wash when the power washer going to do the job? That's the biggest waste of time I ever heard of. That white lady smiled at me, and five minutes later, I was out on the street. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, but I got to do a talk at a church in Atlanta. I'm not a terribly religious person, um, but they asked me one of the most intriguing questions that I've been asked on this tour. First of all, they asked me to speak on my own faith, and I said, not a chance. <laughs> the roof will cave in in the church. <laughs> and then they said, well, what if you talk about the faith of your characters? And it was like a light bulb went off in my head, and I thought, wow, you know, I think it's so important that me, as a, as a woman, as a Southern writer, that is something I have to know very clearly about every one of my characters. And I don't think that's something that writers like, you know, Tom Clancy, um, Sue Grafton have to think about. But it was really important that I knew how my characters spoke to God. There is a scene in the book um, where Abilene, who is an older, the older black woman, um, shares with the reader how she approaches her prayers. So if you'll, if you'll excuse me one more time, I'm going to read in the voice of Abilene. And uh, she's just sitting in her kitchen alone. She doesn't have any family left. She's just reflecting on her day and God. Time to time, I think I might find myself another man, one from my church. Problem is, much as I love the Lord, 
church-going man never did all that much for me. The kind of man I like ain't the man that stays around when he's done spending your, all your money. I made that mistake 20 years ago. When my husband Plunk left me for that no-good hussy up on Ferris Street when they call Coco, I figured I better shut the door for good on that kind of business. A cat gets to screeching outside and brings me back to my cold kitchen. I turn the radio off and the light back on. Fish my prayer book up out of my purse. My prayer book is just a little blue notepad I pick up at the Ben Franklin stove. I use a pencil so I can erase till I get it right. I've been writing my prayers since I was in junior high. When I told my seventh grade teacher I ain't coming back to school because I got to help out my mama, Miss Ross, she just about cried. You're the smartest one in the class, Abilene, she said. And the only way you're going to keep sharp is to read and write every day. So I started writing my prayers down instead of saying them. But nobody's called me smart since. I turned the pages of my prayer book to see who I got tonight. I thought about maybe putting Miss Skeeter on my list. She's the one who talks to me about the separate bathroom. The thing is, if I start praying for Miss Skeeter, I know that conversation going to continue the next time I see her. Because that's the way prayer do. It's like electricity. It keeps things going. In the bathroom situation, that ain't just something I really want to discuss. I scanned down my prayer list. May Mobley's got the number one wrong. Then there's Fannie Lou at the church, ailing from the rheumatism. My sisters Inez and Mabel in Port Gibson, they got 18 kids between them, six with the flu. When the list be thin, I slip in that old stinky white fellow that lived behind the feed store, the one that lost his mind from drinking the shoe polish. But the list's pretty full tonight. And look who there, who else I've done put on this list? Bertrina Bessemer, all people. Everybody know Bertrina and me don't take to each other ever since she called me a fool for marrying Plunk up ten years ago. Minnie, I said last Sunday, why Bertrina asked me to pray for her? We was walking home from the one o'clock service. Minnie said, rumor is you got some kind of power prayer, Abilene. Eh, Gets better results than just the regular variety. Say what? Mm-hmm. Eudora Green, when she broke her hip, went on your list of walking in a week. Isaiah fell off the cotton truck on your prayer list that night, back to work the next day. Hearing this makes me think about how I didn't even get the chance to pray for Trevor. Maybe that's why God took him so fast. He didn't want to have to argue with me. Snuff Washington, many say. Lolly Jackson, heck, Lolly go on your list, and two days later she pop up from her wheelchair like she done touched Jesus. Everybody in Hines County knows about that one. But that ain't me, I say. That's just prayer. But Katrina, Minnie gets to laughing. You know Coco, the one Plunk run off with? Shoot, I say. You know I'll never forget her. Week after Plunk left you, I heard that Coco woke, wake up to her coochie sport like a rotten oyster. <laughs> Didn't get better for three months. Bertrina, she good friends with Coco. She know your prayer works. <laughs> My mouth drops open. You saying people think I got the black magic? <sighs> no, they just think you got a better connection than most. We all on a party line to God, but you... It's like you sitting right in his ear. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I don't want to hear myself talk the whole time, and y'all probably don't either. Yes. What did you do before you wrote this book? What did I do before I wrote The Help? Well, let's see. I've been a waitress. I've been, uh, golly, a personal assistant. I ended up somehow in the magazine business, and that was in New York City. I was there for 16 years, and um, I was just, I was just out of gas. You know, they worked me so hard. I never said no. 
I would do anything. And I was on the business side, so it wasn't creative. I wasn't writing. And one day, I finally just waved my white flag and said, I want a month off, paid, and I don't want anybody to call me or bother me. And my intention was to write um, on a story that I had been working on that was pretty, pretty awful. Um, and I just had it set in my mind that I could turn it around. And that was September 10th, 2001. The next day, day two of my sabbatical, was September 11th. And what happened, you know, I'll tell you, we, I never want to sound like I'm grabbing on to someone else's tragedy, but we lived downtown, and our neighborhood was cut off by the police, and our phone lines had been cut, the cell lines were cut, email was cut. You couldn't communicate with anybody, and that was, that was what they wanted, you know, the police. So, but we, my husband and I, we couldn't even call our family and, and say, we are okay. Um, so I started doing what I think a lot of writers do. I did the next best thing. I started writing in a voice that reminded me from about you know, of home. And that, for me, was the voice of Dimitri, um, which, of course, came out as Abilene and is the first chapter of the book. So, you know, a month later, after I had written, I don't know, maybe 50 pages or something, showed it to my mom. She's like, oh, that's nice. Um, I went back to work, you know, and I, and I worked. Um, I figured I better keep collecting a paycheck. And, uh, and then, you know, it just it became much, much more important to me over the years to get back to the story and to carve out time. I, can't, I know there are so many writers here, and you know how crucial it is for you to carve out that private time in a private space, um, which is hard to do if you live in New York City. You know, square foot is, is hard to come by. But um, I just did what I could do and just went and got hotel rooms um, for the night and, uh, of course, told all kinds of lies to my husband. Of course, you know, had he checked our credit card bills, he would have thought I was having an affair but I never got busted, and I had really only just told him this year. Um, <laughs> but just, yeah, keep in mind, as guilty as you feel about this urge that you have to get away, it's natural, and it's what you have to do to get the story written. Yes, ma'am? Are you working on another book? I am. I'm trying. I've been on tour for about a year and a half now. Um, I'm, I'm working on another story about women. Um, I just, and about, about Mississippi, you know, I have some more things to say about that, that place. And uh, it, it's, once again, it's about women, you know, in tough times coming together and uh, finding, I guess, a, a rather unique way to get by during the Great Depression. So we'll see, I'll get in a lot of trouble for this one. Yes. Well, when I was living in New York, all I wanted to do was write about Mississippi. But now I'm um, living in the South. I just want to write about New York. Um, and no, I never got an accent. And in fact, for those of you that are coming to the party tonight, it will get worse after a glass of wine. <laughs> so yeah, I have some New York stories to tell, but I think I have to wait till my spouse passes away. <laughs> Yes. Well, Peter's hair issues just tickled me because I lived in Tennessee for four years and then felt that pain. Uh -huh, I see um, your hair. Um, <laughs> so I know there are much more um, important issues in the book, but was there any particular inspiration for her revisiting that issue of her? Her hair. Ka Catherine, would you mind repeating the question? Oh, yeah, the question is about hair. And um, why hair plays such an important role in 
a, a, an area of the United States that has 99% humidity, <laughs> and yet it's still not raining. Um, you know, my hair is remarkably straight here in Colorado, but um, if, if, you, if you came to see me in Atlanta, you would, you would know the answer to that. It is huge. So, yeah, hair is an important um, accessory in the South. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. The question is, when did the help in the book become the help? I don't know. I mean, it took me five years to write the thing, and um, it went through so many different versions, and, you know, 10 rejections from agents, 20, 30, 40, 50. Number 60, for some reason, was the magic number for me. Um, I can't say exactly when or why that became part of the story, help being part of the help. I can tell you that it, as a writer, it's so hard to write about anything but writing and not to make writing and writers a part of your story. I just love writers and I love the process that we go through. Um, and I will also share with you that uh, the book was actually called Help the whole, the actual book. And so I finally got an agent and then, you know, a publisher, and she said, oh, you know, big conference call, lots of corporate people on the line. We have one change. We have a change we'd like to make. We're very nervous. And I said, what is it? We'd like to change it to the help. <laughs> you know, I'm rolling my eyes because after 60 rejections, you don't give a rat's ass what they call the thing. You're just happy... <laughs> It's being published. Um, so, you know, I did a nice pregnant pause and a sigh and said, well, okay. <laughs> but Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. Are there any men with questions? No men? Those are, yes, sir. Was I there in 63? I was not. But continue. Even, I don't care. I'm 41. Um, it was just a, an incredible year in, in the, the history of not just Mississippi. I think the question is why did I pick that particular year? And it was such a crucial year in American history. I mean, it started, I mean, it really started in the 50s with Rosa Parks, but in 63, man, it was just a hotbed. And the, you're right, the Freedom Rider, Riders were coming through, and uh, Medgar Evers was assassinated. Um, Martin Luther King did his march on Washington. The President of the United States was assassinated. And it just blows my mind um, to think that all of this happened in such a short amount of time. And then, um, and then it worked out from a, a timeline for me because I wanted to end the story with the passing of the Civil Rights Act, which was right around 64, 65. And the end of the story is, you know, Abilene's walking down the sidewalk and the sun shining and... You know, it is a sad ending, but I wanted her to be walking into a new era, an era of, of more hope. And it wasn't going to happen overnight, but just her knowing that it wasn't, it, it wasn't over. Um, so that was really why I chose that year and the, those, that span of years. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question's about the movie, and I have to tell you, I love this question because I'm so excited. Um, I grew up with a, a guy named Tate Taylor, and 
I know there's got to be at least one person in this room who knows him because he knows everybody. And we were such troublemakers growing up. We went to high school together. We grew up down the street. Both our parents were divorced. So, you know, it was just a ticking time bomb every night in the summer of when our parents would go to sleep so we could sneak out. We stole a car at age 14 and drove his dad's car, not like just a random car, to New Orleans, which was three hours away, (laughs) to have supper. And we had a ball. And we just, we got home and we just took the punishment and it was worth it. But if you know Tay, you'll know that's just who he is. He's so fun. He's so creative. And if you had asked Tay in high school, what do you want to be? He would have said a filmmaker. And if you had asked me, I would have said hands down a writer. And uh, Tate was one of my early readers of The Help and early supporters and, you know, all those times where you want to just give up and throw a fit, and he just kept pushing me on. And so he said one day, let me make the movie. So, uh, you know, we we fought about it. We fight like brother and sister, but we, we struck a deal. And Tate's so smart. I mean, he hadn't broken into the film business whatsoever. This was last year. Um... And he was living in Los Angeles, and so he's so smart. He didn't know he he knew that he could not shop a 500-page novel around Hollywood. They just they don't they don't have that kind of capacity. <laughs> so he wrote a 130-page screenplay that is gorgeous, and he shopped it around for about two months, and then Steven Spielberg called him and said, "Come." come over, let's watch some movies together. And I think he was kind of trying Tate out to make sure he was, you know, uh, really had good intentions. And they watched a couple movies together, and and then Steven was like, let's make a movie. So Steven Spielberg is the studio. Chris Columbus, who did the Harry Potters, is the producer. Um, Tate Taylor is the director and screenwriter. Octavia Spencer plays Minnie. Of course, her and Tate lived together in L.A. It was, it was a big setup, the whole thing. Um, I had absolutely no input on the screenplay except a phone call once a week that said, Oh, Kitty, I don't understand why you called this, that, or what, why'd you put that in there? Or, God, do you know how, how hard it's going to be for us to find a stuffed grizzly bear? And, you know, and just hysterical things. So I'm very much in tune to what's going on, but thank God I'm not a part of the writing process because... I just, it, I'm, I, I would, I wouldn't know what to cut. I wouldn't know what to leave out or leave in. And he did an amazing job. So I don't know who any of the actors are. I've never heard of anybody, um, but I'll tell you who they are, and maybe you'll know. Emma Stone plays Skeeter. Um, Ron Howard's daughter, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, plays Hilly. Octavia plays Minnie. Viola Davis, who I do know, uh, oh, wonderful, is um, Abilene. Yeah, she just won the Tony. Um, who else? Allison Janney plays Skeeter's mother, who I adore. Um, it's just going to be a lot of fun. So they start filming uh, mid-July in Greenwood, Mississippi. Skeeter? Celia? Celia? Who's playing Celia? Does anybody know? I don't know. But hopefully she has really big cans. (laughs) Lisa, how are we doing on time? I don't know where you are. Okay. Um, Yeah. Uh huh. I was really nervous. I'm still nervous. Um, but the question is, was I nervous writing in the voice of, of black people? Um, yeah, totally nervous. Well, I mean, I, honestly, I didn't think anybody was going to read it. So when I wrote in these voices, it was truly a story for me. And, yeah, I worked on it for two years before I started sending it out to agents. Um, and I, I guess... Where I've ended up on that, I I can't even describe to you the angst and turmoil I've gone through over this year. 
over maybe I've overstepped. Yes, I have over, you know, just all these feelings. But where I've ended up right now is that I think it is so important as a writer to try and help people understand what it feels like to be in someone else's shoes, whether that person is black or white or, you know, a, a midget or a giant or whatever. It is my job to, to transpose the reader into this, a different set of bones and flesh. And if I do a good job at that, then I, I feel like I did my job. If I can't convince you that you really understand how this person feels, then I need to go back and write it again. Um, so, yeah, there's still, you know, and, and some parts of me feel like my due's still coming. You know, but if it does, I'll, I'll, I kind of almost wish it would just go ahead and get it over with. Um, <laughs> I know that sounds ridiculous, but, but the, the, the love and, and the letters I get from people all over the world um, is just amazing. They don't all love it. I got a letter from a woman in prison in California the other day saying, she, and, and I, I'm pretty sure she was African American, and she said, you know, I love the book, I love the setting, but you got such and such wrong, and I just didn't appreciate that. I only get to read one book a month, at, you know, at, at, right here in the jail in the penitentiary. And, um, but I'm just so excited that people are talking about this topic as of Yesterday, it's being translated into 37 languages. Um, and one of the first letters I got, when I, I used to put my email address on my, on my website, but I've, I've since taken it down. Um, but one of the first letters and emails I got was from somebody in Rome. And, you know, I live in Atlanta. I thought it was Rome, Georgia. <laughs> It was the real, the real Rome, and they were just telling me that they identified with the story, not because it was black or white or whatever, but because it made her reflect on how much has changed in the world in such necessary and decent ways, and also that hope of how much more change we are capable of, and that was just that was a really cool moment for me. Reading, reading that that email. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question is how how did I um, well, I, you know, I just, that's just the way the people in my childhood talked. Um, Dimitri had a very rich vernacular. One of the criticisms I get is, why did you make the white dialogue so straight and narrow and the black, um, dialogue, you know, so broken and, and, um, ethnic? And, you know... I'll tell you, my grandmother is American, but her family, they were missionaries in Shanghai. And um, she understood the class system better than most people and lived by those rules. So when she came back to Mississippi, when she spoke the king's English, as, as does still my stepmother. And it was not so much that they... It wasn't just an education barrier. It was that you tried to speak very properly because it reflected on your social stature as a white person in Mississippi. Um, the black dialect, you know, you got to remember, I'm just, I was just trying to capture one very small socioeconomic um, bubble. I wasn't, I was, wasn't trying to say that's how all black people. I mean, Abilene went to, through, I think, eighth grade, many through eighth grade. There was... You know, their education stopped, and everyone in their lives spoke a certain way, and that's just what I knew. But most importantly, I loved intermingling that rich um, dialect of the black people with the stiff white and just watching it kind of dance on the page. So, you know, I just I wrote it just because I like the way I 
it sounded to me, not because I thought anybody else was going to, you know, look at it. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, Liz. Do you think, since we talked about the cover yesterday, yeah. do you think now with 37 different languages, your, the original wonderful picture will be on those covers in the other countries and will it ever get? Liz and I. Our talked about this yesterday. It's about the cover. I did a little short event yesterday, um, so forgive me if you're hearing this story twice, but um, the cover of the help in the United States, um, originally, one of the first choices I got from my editor was um, a black and white photograph of a black hand holding a white baby hand. It was an older black hand, you know, where you could see the creases holding a white, and I just, ah, I fell in love with it, and I emailed my editor. I said, yes, let's do that, and then, you know, a few minutes later, I got this phone call, and these emails and everything was just blowing up, and they were like, no, 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 we can't, we can't use that picture because people might think it's about race. <laughs> I said, oh, oh. So we then went through, I don't know, 30, 40 more versions of covers that slowly crept away from the topic until finally my publisher and editor found this painting by Ellen Granter that I love. And it's um, three birds uh, standing on a, a limb or a wire. And the truth is, I believe they chose that cover because it has absolutely nothing to do <laughs> with the story. Um, now, Flash forward six months later, my UK publisher s says they don't have to do the same covers. They usually don't do the same covers in different countries. She says, we don't want to use that cover. We have a photograph that we love. <laughs> it wasn't the one, though. It was a photograph, and Liz was so nice to bring um, a copy of it, of the, the, um, the UK edition of two black maids you know, in uniform with a little white baby in an old-fashioned stroller. And on the bottom, it was a real photograph taken from the um, Library of Congress, and uh, it had been handwritten, Port Gibson, Mississippi, uh, 1940. So before I emailed my publisher back in, in London, I looked at that and that handwriting, so I emailed it to my friend Charles's mother who lives in Port Gibson. I said... Sarah Jane, who is that? And she looked at it, and she said, Oh, that's Sarah Chrysler on the corner of Church Street. <laughs> she had two maids, because they owned the local newspaper, and they, had, they were wealthy. And so I emailed Juliet back, and I said, I think that's a perfect photograph. Absolutely, you can use that, because that's just little Sarah Jane Cr Chrysler on the corner of Church Street with her two maids. And I gotta tell you, I love perpetuating this myth that Mississippi is just one tiny little town. <laughs> they all pass each other in the drugstore every day. But this is, this is the cover that I just, I love. I understand why they had to do the US cover because it is still the topic in the US that, that people don't wanna discuss. In the other countries, they love to talk about the U.S. problems with race. <laughs> um, it comes out in France in September, and so we'll see how they take to it. Because, you know, they love making fun of Americans over there, and I'm hoping they'll love it because I'd love to go on book tour in France, but <laughs> that's another story. The, it's called Le Couleur de Sentiment in France, the color of emotion or feeling or something so maybe are we maybe two more questions lisa is that okay okay all right yeah well the question is dimitri dimitri died when i was 16 and she had no children her husband was very abusive so abusive that somebody in our family gave her a pistol and my, I was told that Dimitri slept with it under her pillow, loaded at night. 
in case Plunk came home, you know, drunk and in the mood to throw a fit. So her, her parents died when she was young. Um, she had an aunt and uncle that raised her that died a, a while back. I have yet to, you know, find any trace of her. And in some ways, I think maybe it's better. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, that would be a hard conversation to have because maybe those family members would think that I've capitalized somehow on Dimitri's life when the truth is it was a voice that I wanted to capture, but the story, and I truly cannot tell my family this enough, it is fiction. <laughs> um, but, but maybe somebody will come along and I'll be ready, you know, and they'll be ready for that. Yes. How long did it take you to write the book? Oh, it took me about five years to write the book because um, I wasn't in any hurry. Um, I think as writers, if you really give yourself time and space, you intuitively know what's working and not working in a story. Um, I think I am my own best editor, you know. If something nags at me and I'm too lazy to change it or make it right, sometimes it's a blessing that the first agent doesn't take you, <laughs> you know, or the 35th. Um, because you need that time to figure out how can I make it better. So trust, trust your voice is what I'm telling you and give yourself time. Yes, sir. Have I found different reactions in different parts of the country? Um, Yes, different and, and similar. You know, the, the reaction I get from Southerners is, uh, oh my gosh, you told my story. You told, the, you talked about the woman that worked for our family. Or, you know, I'll hear, how dare you, have, you know, wrote this story, you crossed the line. From Yankees, I usually hear, oh my God, I had no idea that was going on down there. <laughs> Um, but in the same sentence, they'll say, you know, thank you for sharing, for opening a door that I never even knew existed. So, yeah. And, and again, I get a little upset. There's a question that no one's asked tonight, today that I'm really grateful of, and that is what is the African-American attitude about it? And I'm glad the question has started to irritate me because in my own education, writing and researching, it's, it is just so evident no, no person is represented only by the group that they fall in. Every black person has a different opinion. Every white person has a different opinion. Yes, we have similarities in some ways, but it's not as if one group of people all shares one opinion about something. So thank you for not asking that. I hope no one had it on the queue. <laughs> okay, yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry, I'll get to you next. What is the status of black women in the South today? Again, it's so different. It's every person, it lives a different life. And also, I have to tell you, um, I'm not an expert. I'm not an anthropologist, nor do I live in Mississippi. But, um, I, you know, I know, I know people of colors and class who live all such different lives. So. I'm sorry, I don't really have an answer for that. Yes? Uh huh. Well, thank you. Oh, thanks. That's nice to hear. If it's okay, I'm going to read one really short passage um, that I like to read at the end because kind of sums up how I feel about Mississippi. And I think this is a great forum for me to read it because um, the topic is Old South versus New South. And it's such a hard question to ask a Southerner. So I'm going to share this with you, and then we'll, we'll go to the signing. And this, is, this comes at the end of the book. It's called In Her Own Words, where I got to actually you know, speak from my, my point of view. The rash of negative accounts about Mississippi in the movies, in the papers, on television, 
have made us natives a wary and defensive bunch. We are full of pride and shame, but mostly pride. Still, I got out of there. I moved to New York City when I was 24, and I learned that the first question anyone asks anybody in a town so transient as New York is, where are you from? And I'd say, Mississippi? And then I'd wait. <laughs> to people that smiled and said, oh, I've heard it's beautiful down there, I'd say, my hometown is number three in the nation for gang-related murders. <laughs> to people that said, God, you must be glad to be out of that place, I'd bristle and say, what do you know? It's beautiful down there. <laughs> when a drunk man at a roof party from a rich, white, Metro North train type of town asked me where I was from, and I told him Mississippi, he sneered and said, I am so sorry. So I nailed down his foot with the stiletto portion of my shoe and spent the next 10 minutes quietly educating him on the where from abouts of William Faulkner, Eudora Welty, Elvis Presley, B.B. King, Oprah Winfrey, Faith Hill, James Earl Jones, and Craig Claiborne, the food critic for the New York Times. I informed him that Mississippi hosted the first heart transplant the first lung transplant, and that the basis of the United States legal system was developed at the University of Mississippi. I was homesick, and I'd been waiting on somebody like him. <laughs> I wasn't very genteel or ladylike, and the poor guy squirmed away and looked pretty nervous for the rest of the party, but I couldn't help it. Mississippi is like my mother. I am allowed to complain about her all I want, but God help the person that raises an ill word about her around me unless she is their mother too. Thank you. Catherine, thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us. Please join us in the lobby for a book signing with Catherine, and uh, thank you again. We'll see you the rest of Summer Words.